Hey people, Siobhan here dropping in at the start of the episode to again remind you to check out the website for the fabulous Animal Public's book series. Animal Public is part of the University of Sydney Press. I'm looking at their website right now and I'm seeing some fantastic books on offer. Authors such as John Simmons, Christine Townsend, Peter Chen, Peter Tate. Wow, Fiona Proben Rapsy. Jay Johnston, this is fantastic. You have got to think about getting involved with animal publics. If you're going to write an animal studies book or if you want to stock up on suitable books for your institution, that's Animal Publics, part of the University of Sydney Press. This is another iRaw podcast. We podcast to make the world a better place for animals. Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan does like knowing animals. Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan does like knowing animals. Hey people, welcome to Knowing Animals. My name's Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like knowing animals. This episode of Knowing Animals is from our Protecting Animals series where we speak to animal advocates past and present about the work they do for animals. Now this episode of Knowing Animals is brought to you by ASA. ASA is the Australasian Animal Studies Association. I love ASA. I think they're an absolutely wonderful organisation. I'm a member. In fact, did you know that I'm a founding member? I was there at the very, very first ASA conference in 2005 And I was there in 2009 when ASA constituted and became an incorporated organisation. So I'm a long-time supporter of ASA. They do a lot of hard work to support animal studies scholars. So I really encourage you to think about becoming a member of ASA, the Australasian Animal Studies Association. Well, this episode of Knowing Animals is coming to you from Christchurch in New Zealand, where I'm attending the uh, Decolonising Animals Conference, which is the 2019 ASA Biannual Conference. And I'm really, really thrilled to be able to introduce you to somebody who I met when I was actually at the Minding Animals Conference in Mexico. Now, this is the point in the program where I realise that I don't know how to say people's names. I should have practised. I can do the first name, Terry. <laughs> so I'm joined here by Terry Hurtado. Hurtado. Hurtado, who's from the Animal Liberation Federation in Colombia. Welcome to the podcast, Terry. Hello, Siobhan. Thank you so much for having me. It's so wonderful to have you here. Now, we tried to do an episode when I was in Mexico and it just got crazy and we didn't record it. And so now Christchurch has given us a second opportunity. So Terry, can you start by telling us why you got involved in Animal Liberation Federation? Well, um, this was an organization we founded around 2005 after I was out of my city for um, my second career studies. I went to another city to um, study mathematical education. And when I came back, well, um, we thought with some friends we should start something um, again and get some things moving in the city. And initially it was thought as a federation with a signal uh, um, topic that was anti-bullfighting. But uh, afterwards, we finally decided we couldn't get only in one s- only topic, and it was better to embrace uh, a, a wider um, view and, w- and wider issues. So that was the the or- origin of this. Wonderful. Well, Terry, I was really fortunate to hear you deliver one of the keynote addresses last night and you did a really good job of bringing the audience into the context. So, for the benefit of the people listening at home, can you tell us a little bit about Colombia, where it is, what the issues are, its kind of overall political climate? Yes, um, Colombia is in the northern corner, left corner, of South America, in between uh, Venezuela 
and Ecuador. And it has the south of Colombia is part of the Amazon. So we have a very rich and diverse ecosystems from deserts. We have two coasts, um, one in the Caribbean, the other in the Pacific. And we have snowy mountains. It's a very diverse ecosystem and as well, very diverse cultures. So all sorts of, um, yeah, culture developments, um, indigenous people, although the indigenous inhabitants in Colombia are around 1%, you know, the colonization of Sp the Spanish invasion really um, killed every, most of the, uh, of, of the communities, at least in, in, an, in reducing their number. And there is a big percentage of um, African Colombians that are around 30% of the country, although they are um, very much situated in the coasts of the country, uh, the Caribbean and the Pacific coast. And they are also the most um, excluded and marginalized um, members of, of, of Colombia. The poorest cities uh, are in the coast and are um, African Colombian inhabitants. So you could see how historical um, margination of um, African Colombians and indigenous are still a issue today. Colombia has just um, passed through a very important moment that was a peace treaty for with a guerrilla that um, left wing that um, started uh, a raisement against uh, the government, the, the state, 50 years ago. And this brought um, some interesting discussions and some hope for peace, even though there's also another guerrilla group still uh, fighting, but created a, a reaction in the ultra-right wing um, people and party and this has brought an increasing number of murders of social leaders in the past years. Um, the last elections that were in July of 2018, the ultra-right wing um, party member won the elections. Um, he is continuing the two periods of, of the presidents of Álvaro Uribe, which started in um, 2002 and took the country to a level of internal violence to social leaders, activists that haven't um, s been seen for several decades before. And this s reduced a bit during the period of the peace process where the president a Santos was in power and that was the person that leaded the agreements with the guerrilla the FARC and now um, the president Duque uh, got to the office and this has brought again uh, a raisement of violence the paramilitary groups have um, come again to target uh, leaders, they have start to expand again and it's a very unease situation we are living in in the country because of this political context. Mm. Interesting. And Terry, I lived for a year in Bolivia in South America as an exchange student when I was in high school and I've been back a few times since. It is a very meat-orientated um, culinary tradition in, in Bolivia and surrounding countries. What is the kind of Colombian, the typical Colombian um, eating mode? Well, um, in Colombia, a uh, normal lunch would be probably some beans, meat, rice and potatoes or 
plantain that I don't know if it's known um, by some people. It's kind of a big banana um, that usually is fried or roasted. Mm, and it could be more half when it's uh, um, not mature. Mm, so people would have a phrase that's um, longer than a week without meat. So people do like meat and many people if they don't have a piece of animal in their plate they feel they haven't had lunch you know if it wasn't a proper meal so mm, this is uh very much the uh, eating habits although they have been a great increase of vegetarian and also vegan but mostly vegetarian um food offers uh, mostly restaurants now there's also some options in non-vegetarian restaurants in many non-vegetarian restaurants there are at least one vegetarian option and some supermarkets start to offer kind of um, you know sausages hot dogs um, kind of salami all these like vegan um, option but uh, it's still it's still a very meat orientated um, country and part of the shift has been happening because of health issues so that's a big driver and of course um, animal rights is is, is uh, the big driver of of the little shift we are um, living through about food so at least in the big cities, y which is where you live, you're not completely, you know, people don't look at you as though you've got two heads. If you request vegan or vegetarian food or, or announce to people that you are vegan. Not now. Um, I'm, I stopped eating animals 23 years ago, more or less, 24, something like that. By then, I was probably, by then I was um, 16. And by then... I was probably the only vegetarian I knew that was vegetarian because of animals. Um, the rest of the vegetarians in town were linked to religious or spiritual um, paths, let's say. So Krishnas, um, other Asian spiritual um, groups, um, Adventists. And it was very rare to, uh, to find something someone that was vegetarian because of environmental issues or animal rights issues now that is um the the mainstream it's usual people will assume you're a vegetarian because of animals more than environment but because of animals that you are linked to a religious um group mm. so you mentioned bullfighting I must admit I hadn't realised that bullfighting was happening in Colombia. It's not something that kind of happens in Bolivia, which I guess is my closest point of reference. I think probably most listeners would have a bit of a sense of what goes on in bullfighting, but could you perhaps say a little bit more about why you think it's an objectionable, inappropriate, unethical way to treat animals? Yeah, bullfighting is a... Um one of the the links we have in the present to uh, a very old mindset, a mindset that comes from the monarchy um, period of Spain, and that is a, a a practice that colonization left us, and from which we haven't been independent yet. So we did get some political independence, but uh, uh, culturally, this embodies colonization. So there's, at the beginning, this um, element of, of still we're carrying with those cultural elements of colonization in the country. And then um, when it goes to the animals, it's a terrible treatment where animals are, are absolutely um, uh, objectivized 
and torture in the most ter- terrible way. First, they um, are put um, in a arpon. Um, a, a ha- is it a harness or uh, no, no, no? Um, they're stabbed. Oh, okay. With, um, like a spur, so like a harpoon, are you yeah, saying? Yeah, 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 so it's a spur that uh, comes out and curls back a little bit. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So this little harpoon, it's called a divisa. And people don't notice this is the first element of torture. Um, they Before they go out. And it's something like when they put um, the prices, uh, the horses that are in, in a... In exhibition, um, these colorful, um, you know, kind of they distinguish ornaments. Yeah. ornaments yep. Yeah. But in this case, it has a harp on. Right. So that's the first element. Okay. People so they're already been stabbed. <laughs> exactly. They're stabbed, and that's why the animal s- opens when just when the door opens, starts running. Right. It's one of the reasons he starts running. He's also trying to, to to run away, find a way out of a very um, uh, an environment that's absolutely new, where he doesn't feel comfortable, when he feels in risk, and he starts moving around the the bull ring, trying to find his way out. And he yeah, it's really a. To- I mean, it's designed as a torture. A site of torture for the bull. It's round. There is no way out. It's all designed for the human to have the advantage from the onset. Of course. And then this bull fighter is not alone. No, he's He has a, a team that whenever he has, he's in, prob- in, in trouble, well, that team uh, supports him. So afterwards, one of the, the first persons of the team that helps this torture is um, a guy that has a big um, weapon that's called uh, kind of a oh gosh I is it like a big spear or is yeah. it or is it like a uh, it's like it pro- a big prod you can prod yeah. the animal with it yeah, is it so also sharp does it have it's a sharp little okay. in, in, in it's in it's um in it's it has a point where it's all uh, pyramid shaped metal um point yeah and this is used to stab right. in the back from a horse okay um the bull yeah. so um uh, this is called el 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 no el banderillero i'm confusing here the names uh but that's okay i mean it's a massive spear that some uh-huh. Bastard puts into the back of a poor bull from a horse, right? Yeah. Yeah. So th- that's that is um gets a massive, a massive um uh, injury to the to to the bull, and he bleeds a lot. And then in that moment, of course, the bull attacks the horse. So we have another, oh, another victim, victim. Mm. there. That's the horse. Yeah. Today, um, lucky enough, the horses are protected, even though many horses get um, badly injured, and sometimes they get their their guts, you know, out because um, the bull horns them. Um, but this is a uh, protection that's from the late thirties. Before that, um, the horses didn't have no protection, and each bullfight would have several uh, horses injured, badly injured. So for every bull, there was one, two, three horses that many times were injured. Oh, isn't that terrible? I didn't even stop to think about the horses. Mm. Yeah, and so people go and watch this? Yes. So that wa- that's the rejoneador. And after the rejoneador um, goes the banderilleros. Uh, the banderilleros are the people that put the another arpon, and they put six of them bigger, uh, 
also in the upper part of the bowl. This type try to shape um, the the way the 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 bull is is putting his head because after uh, this injury, his head is 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 not very. It, it could be not according to the parameters the bullfighter needs it to be in order to do a, a good performance. Mm -hmm. So they shape it. It's a very, you know, Foucaultian, um, <laughs> tragical way of the shaping of bodies. And here the bodies are shaped. The domination of bodies are, are, are done through um, pain and through this instrument's of torture that are all the weapons they use huh? mm. and then at the end um they stab him with a sword right that's terrible terry that's really terrible okay so <coughs> nobody go and see bull fighting and <laughs> so what people do go and watch this or are they finding the crowds are diminishing is it at least a bit unpopular yes it has diminished very much um in in my city in we started in 1996 the first protest you know, against bullfights in front of the bull ring by then the bull f um the the, the bullfight um season went from last week of december until the 5 of january and now that has decreased and it ends the 30th of December. So now it's just a week, whereas oh before it was two weeks. And the number of um, public has reduced almost to the half. So, And this is happening all over the country where there's still uh, bullfights, mostly in the s big cities where there is bullfights because not in not all the cities there are bullfights. But Bogota, Medellin... And where it stopped actually in Medellin, it stopped last year. Uh, in Bogota, it stopped during four years in a period of a mayor that was on our side, <laughs> and but it started again. And in Manizales, that's another city where it's a, a big thing. So, can you see yourself and your organization having an impact, starting to change? either public attitudes and or policy? Yes, it uh, has been a, 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 a big impact that the movement, the anti fighting movement, had had in the past years. So today it's a culture achievement that we had had um, in which 90% of the people in Colombia want abolition of bullfights. It hasn't happened because the most powerful people are the ones that go to bullfights. You know, the presidents, the ministers, the owners of the big, big companies, the big landlords. Um, so it's a fight with the establishment of the country. And in the other side, it has been raised its relevance into be a... Uh, element of the public agenda even for presidential debates so in the last presidential debates the bull fights were an element that were discussed by um, president uh, presidential candidates and today animal rights in general um, or animal well animal rights animal welfare there it's you know um, are in the public agenda for elections. Well, that's a big achievement. Just getting something on the agenda is a very big achievement. So, Terry, we're getting close to the five quick questions, but can you just tell us quickly a little bit about your organisation? Do you work full-time for it? What, what, how many members do you have? What are your hopes for the future, that kind of thing? Yeah, no, Colombia, th there, I believe there's not much um, organizations that have um, staff properly, maybe some welfare um, organizations that have, uh, you know, a, a vet because they have a shelter 
um, but activist organizations we don't have staff and it's volunteer work so um we do campaigning on several topics as bullfights as um we, we just uh finished a few years ago a big campaign that was around circus and we achieved with other organizations the law that um, banned the use of wild animals in, in circus um, we also work on campaigning and a little bit uh, um, lobbying w for um, cats and dogs issues in the city uh, get a, a um, welfare center uh which is we don't have nothing well in the last years there's something but we don't have much um to attend the animals that are homeless um horses that are uh working or exploded uh, pulling uh, wagons this has been a, a long-term issue of campaigning and there's some advances uh, as well as horse parades that are very nasty for horses and also it's linked to it's an intersectional issue because uh, in these horse parades you could see all the machism and patriarchal mindset going on and women are used just like uh, you know decoration for these guys that are considered the one to show themselves as important and, and rough and so um, it's 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 a, uh, one of the things we have been campaigning and then veganism as well um, doing vegan um, cooking workshops um, sample tables um, we also have a school for activists um, that runs once a year more or less depending the time and stuff it has um three levels although we at the moment have only been able to deliver two levels like a basic and a, a middle um level um we do that as well and sometimes um talks with schools with children more education and some academic events uh once in a while. Wonderful. Well, it sounds like you're busy and you've got your hands full. So thank you so much for all the work you do for the animals in Colombia. Hey, people, it's Siobhan here just dropping in very quickly before we hear the five quick questions. Now, have you heard of the Tiny Beam Fund? If you haven't, you should have heard of them and you're going to hear a lot more about them into the future. The Tiny Beam Fund is a US-based charity that exists for the purpose of encouraging and perhaps most importantly funding rigorous academic research looking at industrialised agriculture, specifically factory farming. And even more specifically, they're interested in looking critically evaluating and considering factory farming in middle and low income countries. But they've got a broad charter to cast a critical academic rigorously academic eye over factory farming in all its guises. Now, they currently have a grants program open. Grants are open now and they clo applications close on October 11th, 2019. You can apply for up to 10,000 US dollars to support your research endeavours. I have had a small grant from the wonderful people at the Tiny Beam Fund and um, I really encourage you to go and check out their work and think about making a funding application. I can remember a time when it seemed almost impossible to get funds to do research into animal-related issues and look, here we are, 2019, and we've got the Tiny Beam Fund that exists specifically exclusively to facilitate academic research into intensive animal agriculture. So check them out. That's the Tiny Beam Fund and their current funding grant falls under the title of the Burning Questions Initiative. Now you can find a link to their website in the show notes or you can put Tiny Beam Fund into Google and you'll get there. Get applying. Now, Terry, I ask everyone who comes on the program to answer five quick questions. Are you ready for your five quick questions? Hopeful. <laughs> 
Can you recall when you first started to think that there was something wrong or problematic about the relationship between human and non-human animals? Yeah, I think that was something when I was around probably 14 um, at the moment. Uh, I think I'm kind of son of a generation. All what was happening by then and all the information I, I was receiving. Uh, so I was questioning myself, not what's, what's wrong with the relationship with animals, but with everything, probably. Environment, uh, political issues. I was, um, yeah, with, with um, peace, with war. Um, and there was an element that, I think inc- unconsciously it ended up working out on on you know, taking me to, to think more and, and take action afterwards. That was seeing a terrible act against uh, uh, an animal that was murdered in front of me. I, I was, um, I've been very much um, always interested in science. So... I was 14 and I was um, making a, a telescope. There was a this gentleman that was the only person that by then uh, built handcraft telescopes in, in town. So he was teaching me to, to do one. And this is a very, very demanding and boring <laughs> task okay. because you have to shape a, uh, um, a glass, uh, like a... a uh, cake glass and and saw it with saw paper and for hours walking around in circles. So after three or four hours, I was just taking a break in front of of the door of his house, and this guy, I, I just saw this this little dog running away with his um, his leg broken, and behind them, behind him, came this big fat guy with a stick and just beat them in front of me. I just reacted like turning around and trying not to see this. I, and I, I was in shock. Uh, and pff, that was, I think, that something that definitely w- is in my mind still and behind. I think that's an uh, unconscious element. Um... And all this, all this information of that time, of what was happening with environment, uh, of thinking about life, thinking about um, international issues, Carl Sagan and Cosmos had a big influence on me, uh, made me question relationships in general, not only animals. Right, wow, powerful. I'm sorry you had to say that. I'm sorry for the dog as well. Can you recall the first thing you did to try and bring about change for animals? Yeah, well, um, around that time, I closely after that uh, that moment, I got involved with um, youth, the youth movement, and uh, we started uh, a little magazine. And then also I got involved in a radio show. Um, and from those places, we started to, to say things and, and question things from. And shortly after, it, that was probably all in, in a year time, maximum two years time, we also started uh, an organization that was called... Uh, ecological Mururoa movement because of the French um, atomic um, explosions in the Pacific su- South of in the atolons of Mururoa and Fang- Fangataufa. So we started to graffiti the bull ring. <laughs> uh, we're we're um, teenagers, so we went at midnight and graffiti the bull ring and that, those kind of things, you know. <laughs> If you had to name one animal advocate who's had a big impact on you, who would it be? Uh, I think it would be Jordi Casadmajana. 
Jordi is a, a Catalonian, but he lives, I don't know, more than 20 years ago in, in England. And um, he was campaigning in mid-2000s against bullfights. And he went to Colombia. And actually, he's one of the founders and, and the person that had the idea to um, create the international anti bullfighting um, network. And I found Jordi a very inspiring person. And uh, by then, veganism was not very well known or heard about in Colombia. Um, I started to hear about veganism, although I was mostly vegan by then. I didn't use leather. I didn't um, use um, you know, products that were uh, tested on uh, animals. But I started to hear about veganism in Colombia, maybe starting 2000. And Jordi arrived in Colombia in 2006. And it was like, okay, a, f a first vegan I, I found profoundly respectful um, and uh, very committed and coherent person and with a strong scientific um, basis and uh, very ethical driven. So I, 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 I s am admire very much Jordi and whenever I have the chance to, to meet with him, um, Last year I was in London and I was always go say hi to him. I find he's a very, very inspiring activist. Wonderful. Well, what's the most important thing animal advocates can do for animals? B well, I think f I was I was thinking uh, reflecting about that question, uh, uh, and think everything I, I don't know if there's something that could be most important uh, because I think if there's an animal that is helped in the street by what um, in Colombia we would call rescuers that usually are welfareist that are single issue they just you know work on dogs or cats or well for that animal for that individual um, there couldn't be nothing more important than being helped in that moment. And um, that is, you know, very relevant. But uh, at, at the same time, mm, I think there's so much, so mu this is a complex, uh, complex, very complex um, uh, issues of uh, animals, uh, animal problem. And I'm not sure if there is one like fundamental brick that could probably um, work out to everything else. So uh, everything I, I believe is important, and um, therefore, mm, but everything should be done. However, uh, working on on our mindset on our on our paradigm of how we see and perceive animals and the place we give them in how we relate to them is probably what I find um, could have a, a, a in a longer term or more deeper uh, impact so a working on culturally based in our in dismantling specism and anthropocentrism might be the things I find more interesting. Wonderful. Well, if you had the power to change one thing about the human non human animal relationship, what would it be? I'm not sure. <laughs> 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 um well I think it's related to just what I said. You know, it's it's about um, shifting our way of seeing that other being, seeing them as as a pair, as an equal. If I could see that other as another that um, deserves the same respect I deserve, 
that has its own own feelings and those feelings are as respectable and as honorable and as valuable as mine well i th believe that would um create a new relationship which would not be based on domination and would be res um, based on respect and liberate and liberty and freedom so um i would probably go for um changing that way of of perceiving and and approaching that other animals in that way mm, wonderful well terry what are you working on next well i've been working on and off in a research on the implications and effect and how animals have been affected by uh Colombian's war and how can animals also be an uh, element of peace building and um, trying to get animals acknowledged as victims, officially um, acknowledged as victims uh, from Colombian institutions that are attending and addressing um, victims and peace in all this that's happening in Colombia about um, the post agreement of treaties of peace. So that's one thing, one uh, important thing, uh, and something I'm, I'm committed to. And the other thing is now after, well, this is something I probably didn't uh, talk about. I uh, talked probably in the conference very shortly about it is that the animal rights movement got into electoral politics which is very alien for some of us that were coming from a very critical background uh, regarding to the state but um, that had is perceived as something we must do because there is a big threat at the moment that is that politicians already saw there is a uh, potential voters, a high potential level of voters because of animal issues. And they're w very keen to use it and use and use it in a not uh, in a way that we wouldn't feel comfortable with and that wouldn't uh, represent what we are aiming. So this could be um, very dismissing. So we reflected on this and said well we need someone from our from the movement to be uh, a representative in that n new scenario of fighting for animals otherwise they were as we say call it they're going to steal our flag steal our cows and we're not going to allow that no matter what so um we we run for elections in the past um congress elections and and although we we didn't uh, get there get to the parliament we did pretty well very well it was kind of the electoral surprise and um now uh the movement in in my region we we're doing things very uh horizontally um uh, uh, collectively the decisions are made it uh, has been a very interesting process because we're doing things in a very different way P uh, politics are usually done in Colombia so the movement gave me the responsibility to run for a um, local um, uh, council of the city and so I'm going to be running for elections <laughs> wow well how can people find out more about your work well, I am on Twitter, which I don't use much, as Terry Hurtado. Um, that's well, Terry, T-E-R-R-Y, and Hurtado is H-U-R-T-A-D-O. Also on Instagram, the same way, Terry Hurtado. And on Facebook, um, you can find me as Terry Activista. Activist, Activista, that's in Spanish. 
and that's the way you could find me in uh, Federación de Liberación Animal in Facebook. That's the organization. That, yeah. Wonderful. Well, Terry, thank you so much for joining us and thank you to the listeners for joining us for Knowing Animals, the podcast where we speak to animal study scholars and animal advocates about their work. Now, you can also follow us on Twitter at knowing underscore animals or you can follow us on Facebook at Knowing Animals and we also have an Instagram feed. Don't forget to leave a review on iTunes. Reviews make it easier for other people to find us. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like Knowing Animals. For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D.com.